about, and this is the pattern of illnesses that was actually observed. Mm, this is really ringing some bells with me and my own reactions to uh, seeming electromagnetic frequency here. Now, Penny, you say the council never made the radio network comply with law. Did anyone help you? Well, Dr. Cherry, uh, his physicist was absolutely amazing um, because he, he had recently, as I said, returned from uh, studying the effects of electromagnetic radiation. He, he was a physicist and he was also a weather reporter, so um, he, he was very interested in the whole of nature as well. Um, they, we, there was a, a meeting, um, the organised meeting to, to try and get the council to, to relocate the FM, which they didn't. The council asked uh, the radio network to actually apply for retroactive consent, and that was the time when they actually applied to double the power without any investigation. Uh, we had a very good member of parliament, Mike Moore, who later ca went on to head up the World Health Organization. No, he was not no, World um, Bank, sorry, I've got it wrong. Anyway, he's, he's gone overseas now. And uh, he was prime minister later on. And he wrote and requested the terms of the July 1996 sale in relation to the rear tower from Jenny Shipley, who was prime minister but also minister for Radio New Zealand when it was sold. And she replied it was too sensitive to be released and wouldn't release mm. it. And so when my lawyer, when my lawyer in 2010 asked for the same information, 14 years later, they still said that the um, sale details were too sensitive to be released, which raises serious question marks with me. Yeah. Penny, uh, who are the owners of the radio network? Uh, well, it's quite interesting that their international radio network in 1996 was a newly formed company and it was uh, set up by Irish media giant uh, Sir Anthony O'Reilly um, and he owns APN, independent newspapers in England and a uh, whole stable of media across the world and a Texan firm, which your US listeners may know about, called Clear Channel Communication Limited, which has had many US senators, both Republican and Democrat, as directors. It has a huge international stable of radio stations and they managed to expand these stables in 1996 when um, I think it was a man called Vernon Jordan um, and Mr. Clinton, uh, President Clinton, um, signed the deregulation of the uh, communication industry in the United States which meant they could then own more um, radio stations. Did the radio network uh Penny, get retroactive consent after Dr. Cherry presented his research and asked for the, a, a thorough investigation at all? Yes, it, it was the most extraordinary meeting. There was a, in May 1997, there was a commissioner called Commissioner McCracken, and um, he was um, presented evidence by the um, radio network that there would be no problems at all for them to increase it to four um, because... Um, uh, to transmit from Aruya was 50% less power than, and more efficient than from the hill site of Sugarloaf where it had previously been. Um, and although the commissioner acknowledged in his decision that the radio frequency exposure could be linked to the cluster harm that was reported, he refused to have the investigation which um, uh, Dr. Cherry and Professor Whale, who's a, a top electrical engineer, had requested. And he accepted... Um, but Mr. Collison um, claimed less power and therefore Aruria complied with minimising effects of the utilities as low as reasonably achievable and the precautionary principle. So there were the poor sick people left with the threat that they weren't going to investigate, they were just going to double the exposure. Oh, what happened after this decision was made, Penny? Well, 100 residents appealed this uh, extraordinary decision, which is an extraordinary decision. There are sick people. They know there are sick people. The commissioner acknowledged that, that the people were probably they got better when they went away and that it could be connected, but they didn't have a, 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 you know, an investigation. And um, the residents, under the law, um, it doesn't become legal until an appeal is heard and the residents asked if the council could make them relocate until after the appeal was heard and the council um, the council said no because the radio network engineer Mr Collison said it was impossible to relocate. 
But the really weird thing was we later found out in 2003 that the radio network directors in May 1997 had agreed to allocate 20000 to relocate. And there was no problem in relocating, so you just sort of really wonder what was actually going on behind the doors. Okay, so what happened next, Penny? Well, the council um, were actually told, uh, we, we found out that the um, Arua power was actually 50 times higher than um, than the, the previous site at Sugarloaf and that Mr Collison had actually knowingly presented misinformation to, to um, the commissioner because he'd actually worked um, for Radio New Zealand prior to being sold to Radio Network. So he actually knew that it was um, 48 dBWs at Aurora is 63,000 watts, whereas the previous hill site of Sugarloaf, which is completely unobstructed by anything, was only 1,500 watts. And that's a huge difference in power. Um, anyway, the council refused to have a rehearing, which they should have under the war, law. And the residents, we, there were about 50 of us, actually picketed the road outside the council offices. We, we were very angry and stopped the traffic. And finally, they um, didn't have much choice when you've got lots of noisy people stopping you getting into your council offices. So they agreed to fund a small pilot study to find out if the cluster harm was caused by the emissions. Well, Penny, New Zealand law says that um, if mistaken evidence is presented, uh, that's right. A that's right. It is. The, it yeah. is the law. Um, but mm. they compl- the, the whole way through, and everything from 1996 to 2011, radio network seem to operate completely outside um, New Zealand laws. The council did not make them comply with any law along the way, and it's quite incredible what we're actually looking at. So, what was the result? Uh, well, the result was we managed to get a, a group, um, a man, we approached the university and a man called Professor Sweet and his wife were helped by a vet and an electrical engineer and they found clusters of sick people with uh, symptoms of radiation sickness only occurred with the frequencies focused. And when they turned the power up, the people became sick and when the people went away they from the area they got better and when they came back they got sick again. And the animals, their animals were all sick with the same symptoms in the same locations. So the results of these were um, pretty interesting, but um, that was only a pilot study. It was to be you know, a pilot study to look at it in a bigger area because uh, when they'd investigated in a place called Schwarzenberg in, in Switzerland around an AM tower, they'd had a big team of highly qualified people who had studied this for five years um, and documented thoroughly what was happening, and then the Schwarzenberg Tower was actually removed. So, I mean, a couple of weeks of these people going around local was not a, a full study. It was just a pilot study. Um, when it, the results were released, the radio network then demanded that the council employer, a Dr Bates, to peer review the sweet report. And he claimed that the sweets were biased to the residents, and therefore uh, the whole report should be ignored. Uh, we later found out that Dr Bates has represented industry at many hearings and if anybody was biased, it was him biased to industry. We'd never met the sweets before the study commenced. So what happened next? Well, we wrote 60 Minutes and uh, 60 Minutes were great. They came and um, interviewed us and they put the residents plate on television and they got council officers who they grilled as to what was actually going on and the council officers agreed on on television that the radio network must comply with the law and relocate, but once again this never happened. It never happened because a um, council office uh, legal person um, put in a uh, request to two different law firms who came back and said um, under the law um, uh, they didn't need to apply to increase to FM because FM was a continuation of AM and um, was no different and um, therefore needed to be no consent process at all. Um, Anyway, um, we then uh, went to mediation with Radio Network and uh, the Radio Network directors actually agreed to fund an in-depth health study and an animal study and we were absolutely thrilled because that's what we'd actually wanted right from the time we discovered it was all connected. So um, the Mediation Radio Network agreed to fund an in-depth people and animal study? That's right. 100 people wished to be part of it 
um, Chapman Tripp um, advised that the radio network were pulling out of the whole study because it was too expensive. But it seems pretty incredible that the radio network, this was actually still not legal. The radio network still had the opportunity to go to the government and say, you know, you've sold us a pup and we want our money back. But um, this didn't happen. Um, they pulled out of the health study and um, they did have a vet study. Okay, so um, with, uh, what about the vet study? Did that proceed? It did proceed, but... Um, they had actually agreed, the radio network at the mediation had agreed that they would do this scientifically and that they would do blood and skin tests. But there were no blood and skin tests taken at all. So if you're going to do a vet study, it's, it's, um, it's just a bit of a farce if you actually just, um, just go and sit and listen and talk to the people. You don't go and talk to the vets who have done the, um, the autopsies or the vets who have actually been involved in it. You're just listening to the people who, who are talking about their animals. It was very unscientific. And um, we actually recorded all the interviews and the vets, the two vets that were actually part of the study or doing the study for Radio Network were both in their mid-70s and it was only conducted over two days. So they found it exhausting, slept through most of it and, and we actually discovered later on that the, um, that the results of the report were totally different to what was recorded on, on the interviewees. Um, tapes. So it was all just a big cover-up again. The whole thing was a big cover-up. Mm. So what happened at the Environment uh, Court Appealing Hearing, which uh, sounds like a uh, David and Goliath case with six residents battling this enormous in international-owned corporation? It was quite extraordinary. It was very much a David and Goliath event. The, ho the whole thing beforehand was a David. I mean, we had the the um, lawyers, Chapman Tripp, interfering with the lawyers who were representing us, and we had to get another lawyer. Fortunately, we got a Greenpeace lawyer who, who was absolutely amazing, and, and he was fantastic what he actually managed to grasp of the whole issue and the questions that he asked them. We had a very good electrical engineer who was helping us, and he managed to supply the right questions to ask. Um, it, but it was quite incredible because there were the sick people struggling to get by to even feed themselves because when you're very sick it's hard to go and work and the um, frequencies affect your whole body, your memory, your whole way of, of living is just, is just affected by it. And every morning we would go to the court and 